Hey, what's up? What's up, guys? Welcome back to another shark study party. Dr. Jaws here, and I'm in kind of a new setup. Um, so this is not going to be... Well, it's not permanent yet, but um, different location today, trying out something new. And uh, yeah, we'll see how it works. So far, everything seems to be working well. Uh, but hope you guys are having a good night. Uh, so yeah, we've got the Spade No Shark, um, and with some cool music in the background, uh, we have Civilization 3, one of my favorite soundtracks. Uh, hey, Roy, Roy, what's up? Welcome back. Um, yeah, I'm in, I'm in kind of like a new environment. I hope it's not too, too echoey, and uh, I'll be back to my original location uh, next week uh, for the next stream, but, uh, but I think this is working out pretty well so far. But Hope you had a good weekend. Um, I had a ridiculous weekend uh, where my brothers and there's significant others and my girlfriend, we all did a D&D &D campaign or started one, which is really funny. <laughs> but like, I've never played that before, but, um, but yeah, it was a good time. It was a good, good time. Uh, lots of goofing off. Hey, Howard, what's up? Um, I actually, I hope you had a great weekend. I did not get your drawing, actually. Um, let me see. I don't see it. Um, so, if you sent it through the website, um, I'll double check it uh, as far as like, because the website should be going straight to my inbox, but um, I don't think I see it. Um, let me just kind of scroll through everything. Yeah, if you could resend it, please, uh, that would be great. Because, um, uh, like, uh, I would love to see it. Um, but uh, yeah, I, unfortunately, I didn't receive it, so. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, please, please go ahead and send it, and then, um, if I, if I get it, I'll see if I can, uh, just kind of load it onto the screen. Um, and then, if not, worst case scenario, we can always show it next week, so, uh, cause, you know, like, all art is welcome, uh, of any kind of species, regardless of which species we're talking about, so, uh, yeah. Hey, Minjus, what's up? Welcome back. It's good to see you guys, and, uh, yeah, hope you guys had great weekends. This is going to be a very interesting shark, because uh, the Spano shark is a shallow water species. Uh, it's one of the most heavily fished species um, in its range, and uh, it's a subject of a lot of you know conservation interest. But there's no footage of it, which I'm actually really surprised by. Like, I was uh, kind of scouring YouTube and couldn't find any good clip of the species in life. However, uh, uh, conversely, there's a, there's a lot, lot of research on this species. On this species. Uh, uh, so, so this is going to be kind of more like a study party study science, science night, night. Uh, uh, which is actually, which is actually a lot of research, research on a short time. time. Um, so uh, so uh, 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 civilization is we're back to, to, to I had this on, on one of the streams last year, last year. but, but um, um, it's cool to see, cool to see like, this, like, this soundtrack on Civilization series in particular is a lot of fun because the music evolves through the ages, and I thought it would be kind of cool to pair with this species in particular, because we're going to see the research evolve through time. So starting with the 60s, I think it's a Smithsonian uh, collection article, and then kind of every decade, pretty much, actually, yeah, every decade is represented, uh, henceforth. So you have the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, aughts, and 10s, and 20s, um, you know, for this shark. So it's going to be cool to see. Um, Spano shark is Scolidon laticatus, uh, recently, or recently-ish. Hey, Quackers, what's up? Welcome back. Good to see you guys. Um, but recently, this species has been split into the new spade nose shark. So there's uh, Scolidon laticatus, and then Scolidon, I think, Macrochiris? Um Also, uh, Howard, I just got your drawing. So awesome. Let me go ahead and I think I can airdrop this. So uh, let me go ahead and do that. And give me one second. Um, <laughs> Uh, Quackers, oh, I love this silly little shark. So this one is interesting um, because it has, the, the descriptions for the species keep saying unmistakable. Um, and it's because of the snout where it's actually, it almost is reminiscent of sharks. I, I mean, the first one that kind of comes to mind is like a bonnethead shark, weirdly enough, because the snout is actually very compressed and like unusually so. So it's all, it, actually in a weird way that, that even reminds me of the goblin shark. Um, so, um, oh, uh, Quackers, what's the beats for today? This is Civilization Three. Um, this was the the main Civ game. I don't know if anyone is a fan of Civ or Civilization. Uh, my brother is really good at it. Uh, I'm not as good at it at all. But um, 
Uh, it's a pretty... This was the one that I started out with, uh, was like Civ 3, and then I think I kind of fell out of it, and then had uh, Civ 6 on the Switch, which is pretty fun. Um, so I made a nation of uh, Zakaria with the Zakarian people named after Zack, and uh, the, we're, we're doing okay. Like, like, last time I checked, I think we made it to the Renaissance, and then I, I don't know what happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, but anyway, the point being, the Civ music is a lot of fun. All the Civilization tra soundtracks are really good. But this one in particular, Civilization 3, which I think is from 2001, is, is, is a fun soundtrack. Especially for, like, doing a shark that has a lot of research uh, over time. So I'm trying to airdrop Howard's photo to the computer, and I think it should be coming in. Yep. Haha. -ha. There we go. All right, I hope you guys can see that. I know it's a little dim because I, I just airdropped it, but this is really cool. Um, and actually, I really love the attention to detail of the different uh, fish species. So, uh, Spano shark versus Atlantic codlet. So this is art by Howard Kerr. Thank you so much, Howard, for saying this over. Again, I love your, um, just this feature. This uh, is, I forget if that's, I guess a monogram is the right word for that or, um, like symbol of your art, but I really appreciate seeing it. It's super cool, uh, and like, you know, just just like in general, like like when we went through all, you know, all the art pieces last year, and what we'll do again this year, um, you know, like, it's just it's just cool to see like your collection in particular. Uh, you know, it's it's a lot of fun um, to see these different pieces. So, um, but yeah, so this is actually a really cool drawing of uh, Spano sharks, uh, three of them. Uh, and that's a, it's, it's actually kind of funny. I always think of like um, This really sounds weird, but like um, I, I think many people like most of us are Jurassic Park fans on the stream and like there's some Something about like Requiem sharks like the Carcharhinids that like sometimes I kind of get like a, a raptor vibe from them You know and like I really love this particular piece with three sharks like three spado sharks um, like, I don't think Spano Sharks, I don't know Spano Sharks very well, but I don't think they do cooperative hunting, but, um, this, this piece of art is really cool because it almost looks like they're working together, which I really like. Um, and they might, they might. So, uh, I don't know the species very well because this is an Indo-Pacific species. I'm very familiar with my Atlantic boys, but, uh, when we get to the Pacific, uh, it's always new. So, I'm excited to learn more about this, um, because this is our first shark in the genus Scoliodon. Um, again, the snout is uniquely compressed, and I really love um, species that are like unique, like one of a kind, like you cannot mistake this for anything else. And um, for carcharhinids to have like an unmistakable shark is, uh, you know, not that common. And so it's really cool to see a distinct species like the spando shark. Um, one thing that I also like about the species, and you can kind of see it in this drawing as well, is that the angle of the dorsal, of the first dorsal fin, um, it's a little bit more like forward leaning, um, and like that seems to be a quality that I feel like river sharks share, like the genus Glyphus. Like the trailing edge of the dorsal fin, it's not really vertical; it's like kind of jutting out a little bit, um, which is kind of cool. When you look at the uh, scientific drawing here, the original description of the species. Um, you can see that a little bit. Um, this this is a little bit more conservative looking as far as like, it kind of reminds me of like a sharp nose shark. Um, but the new spade nose shark uh, definitely has that feature that is kind of reminiscent of river sharks where it's like that, the trailing of the dorsal fin seems to be more almost at like a 45 degree angle backwards, um, which is kind of cool to see. So, but this is really cool piece, Howard. Thank you so much for sending this over. And I'm really glad um, uh, we were able to uh, um, show it on the stream, especially since this is the Spade No Sharks special. So, um, oh, hey, I just saw your comment. They school apparently. Okay, that's really cool. So I really love that as far as like, uh, yeah, that's kind of getting closer to the Raptor vibe, which I really love. Um, one kind of funny thing, just a random memory, um, and I might have talked about this before, but uh, when I was handling Sharp No Sharks in the Bay, um, in the Chesapeake Bay and we were like, you know, we had to measure them and, you know, kind of like handle them and stuff. Um, one thing that was like really wild to me was just like the eyes are so like explosive with energy and like in direct sunlight, like the eye kind of like becomes like more of a vertical slit or closer to a vertical slit, which is like that direct, that classic Jurassic Park raptor eye. 
Um, but it's just like, I don't know. Th- I always get this fun vibe with Karkarine and Sharks, like between like Sharks and Raptors. I-, I don't know. There's something about the look and the attitude of Karkarines that just, you know, feels super cool. So, um, but yeah. So thank you so much, Howard. Um, this is going to be a fun night. So I hope you guys have study snacks, study drinks. This is going to be more of a science night and kind of more like, you know, seeing how things change through time. Uh, but we'll do a profile of the Spano shark first. Um, so thank you again, Howard, and uh, let's dive in. So uh, starting out with good old sharkreferences.com, uh, we're going to take a look at um, the general profile of the Spano shark, its conservation needs, you know, whatever basic information we can, then we're going to jump into the 60s and then move our way forward through time uh, with the music. So, uh, Roy, Roy, I love it. Let's go. So, <laughs> all right. So, Scoliodon laticatus, uh, named by Mueller and Alle. Uh So, that's really cool. Mueller and Alle are very famous. Uh, I think they're German ichthyologists. Uh, they are the authors of the bull shark. Uh, so, they are the, uh, the team who discovered, or dis- named, scientifically named, the bull shark. They've named a lot of shark species. So, it's kind of cool to see that Spano shark is part of that, like, part of their, like, uh, time. So, 1838. So, apparently, we've known the species or had an idea of the species um, since 1838. Uh, the original description, check this out. Do you remember that, like, um, when we did our trivia contest with, um, the, uh, the different, like, artworks, um, and guessing what shark, um, uh, like, is corresponding to the artwork? I, it's, I think this is the same thing. The system, I cannot speak German, but systematisch Beschreibung der Plagiostolmen. So it's the same, this is the same manuscript as what we were reviewing when we did our, um, uh, uh, art, uh, contest, like, like our, our, uh, you know, name the shark, uh, and put the shark against the image contest. So it's really cool to see that this species came from that. This description looks a little bit cleaner than the, uh, other piece of art that we saw. Um, this is actually very nice looking. So this is, is this the original description? Image of the original description from 1841. Okay. So... Uh, we'll take a closer look at the teeth. So really nice curve on the teeth, kind of recurve backwards. So very, you could easily see like that razor blade quality. Um, so I'm assuming this is probably a fish eater at least. So um, probably not so much in invertebrates or at least mollusks, but definitely more like, I kind of feel like this is more of an active hunter. Like it's a, it's a little guy, but probably more actively hunting for uh, fish. Um, you can see the snout where uh, this is kind of the key feature of this genus where most um, most carcarinids or at least um, not carcarinids but like most most small carcarinids have more of like a conical snout or kind of like a broad blunt snout like bull sharks have a broad blunt snout sharp nose sharks have more of a conical snout blue sharks have a beautifully like famously conical snout but this this is really flat um, so, um, I'm just getting my directions mixed up. I guess that's laterally compressed, right? Or is that horizontally compressed? I always get the directions mixed up. But anyway, um, very, very flat snout, hence the name Spade No Shark. And then on the other side, um, you know, just from this profile, it looks not too different from something like a sharp nose. Um, but, that, and like, look how angled the jaws are, by the way. This is actually, it's a pretty dramatic angle. It's not like a... U-shaped curve, it's more like a V, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, so pretty extreme look for uh, this species and this group of sharks. Uh, proportionally, the eye looks really big relative to the very, very narrow snout. I have no idea what advantage a very narrow snout would be for a small coastal shark, but uh, I don't know. It's gonna be really cool to learn more about it. Uh, the pectoral fins are rather broad. Uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, the anal fin is huge, actually, if this is still an accurate description. If that is correct, that's very strange looking because the second dorsal fin, you know, uh, looks like a classic second dorsal fin, maybe with a little bit more of a trailing edge, but the anal fin looks twice as large, uh, which is kind of cool. So very different. Let's see. Lots of different names through time. This is the joy of shark classification and shark taxonomy. 
what is that? That's like one, two, three, four, five, like 20, 25 names. That's crazy. So this has definitely been revised a lot through history. Here is, oh my gosh, all right. So here is an actual specimen. And look at that, that, door, that uh, anal fin is huge. I don't think we've ever seen a shark uh, and definitely not like a, a carcarinid um, shark that has such a large anal fin. That's crazy. All right, so this is a pretty extreme looking uh, shark. Um, Cause like, I, this is, I, this, I know this feature doesn't really like stand out at first glance, but like when you compare this to all, all the other carcarinids, this is really weird looking actually. So it's, it's even larger than the pelvic fin, which is like almost unheard of. So that's really interesting. So if you were fishing or, you know, swimming and like see, you see the shark in the wild or encounter the shark, this is, I mean, like the snout is a clear diagnostic feature that, okay, this is, you know, a spade nose shark. But then, you know, if you were doubting in any way, uh, if you just check the anal fin, uh, that's huge. So uh, that's, that's really weird looking. So, okay. L I like how this is unique. A uh, couple different names for this. We have Indian dog shark. Uh, these are really, that, that's a pretty bad English name actually. Cause like, uh, whenever you get like, Dog, like anything dog or cat related, and it's not the true dogfish or the true cat sharks, it always gets confusing. So Indian dog shark, not a good name, not a good name. Sharp nose shark is kind of taken. Spain nose shark is good. Trowel nose shark is cool. The yellow dog shark, eh, I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah, because again, dogfish are completely different order. So it's wise to stay away from like dog names for this order, but um, but I do like trowel nose shark. That's actually pretty cool. So, uh, let's see, we'll kind of skim through the description. I'm going to catch up on the comments as well. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Pointy boy all around. It's a spade shark. <laughs> yeah. Uh, interesting uh, note on the caudal fin. So, uh, the upper lobe, um, so, uh, uh, yeah, quackers. Uh, good point. Good, good, good call on the caudal fin because like the upper lobe is actually really huge. Because usually um, the like for carcarinid uh, caudal fins, um, you know, most like like the upper lobe is a lot smaller. Um, like like you know, but with the subterminal notch, it's like it's usually proportionally a lot smaller uh, compared to the actual fin. But you know, to your point, uh, thank you for pointing that out because like the upper lobe is actually really weirdly huge as well. And then the lower lobe is un it's not as developed. That part is not as unusual, but the upper lobe being huge is really strange. Uh, let's look at this. And they yeah, that's the same thing in this original drawing. The upper lobe is really huge. So, so clearly this, this species has got a lot of weird features and I'm really curious to see how they relate to its habitat or like, I, I wonder what the evolutionary advantage would be to have like, you know, flat spade nose snout, really large anal fin, and then a very large upper lobe. It's 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 a very wonky looking shark, and I don't mean that negatively. I, I mean that as like it's it's very unusual, and uh, yeah, probably wonky was not the right word. Unusual, unusual, unique, unique is a much better way of saying that. So um, yeah, let's see what we have. Unmistakable requiem shark, spade like snout, uh, smooth edge, blade like teeth. Let's see, stocky compressed body. Da, 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 da. Let's see. Don't want to spend too much time on proportional measurements. Yeah, those are. Okay, color light gray, yellowish, or brownish gray above without a color pattern. So. Here's the range um, on this, but I think a better range would be IUCN red list. Um, we'll go back to the shark references. So here's the range of the species. So um, Northeastern Africa, uh, Middle East, India, uh, Indonesia, like South, South, Southeast Asia, uh, Southern Japan, China. So uh, pretty, pretty like sizable distribution. 
Um, no, nowhere near like um, you know what I'm used to as far as like sharks that I study. So uh, it's really cool to see a species that's like brand new. Again, first one of Scoliodon. Um, that's a genus I'm not familiar with at all. So, uh, and also, by the way, I, I wonder what this means. There's this interesting note on the IUCN Red List website. Scoliodon laticaudus, and then parentheses, this concept is no longer recognized. I'm not sure what that means. I don't think I've ever seen that before. So my guess is, is Scoliodon not accurate? Or is there something else going on about the name? So uh, it's not going to be surprising if, you know, the taxonomy is revised again. So, uh, but I thought it was really interesting. Uh, I haven't really seen that before, so... But going back to shark references, let's see. Uh, let's see, viviparous, so it gives uh, live birth with an unusual column, columnar pl placenta. Interesting. Uh, maternal and fetal placenta comprises the entire placenta. Tr Transplacental neutral transfer may be hematrophic. Their size va varies from one to 14. So this is kind of cool. Um, I do want to point this out because um, tiger sharks, tiger sharks, as um, our friend Jess uh, pointed out uh, last year, famously uh, have a unique reproductive mode that's so distinct it, it warranted them to become their own family or be re recategorized in their own family, uh, Gather Sarah today. So it's kind of cool to see that for this spade nose shark, um, you know, it, even though it's a live uh, a shark that gives live birth, there's something a little odd about how it does it. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, and it, it would raise a question like, uh, is this unusual enough to you know kind of go the way of the tiger shark and maybe consider this is not a carcharinid, but maybe its own thing? I don't know. So it'll be cool as we go through the research. Um, you know what the discussion is on this species though. So. Max reported age is about six years. Um, so males maturing at 24 to 36 centimeters. So I suspect this is probably, it's a heavily fished shark, but I suspect it may um, endure fishing pressure better than other species. Cause it seems like it grows, as far as sharks go, um, it seems like it grows a little bit more quickly. Let's see, habitat is demersal. So sticking close to the bottom, um, amphidromus, Brackish, brackish, marine depth range 10 to 13 meters. Whoa. Does IUCN rather say that too? He's updating habitat and ecology. Doesn't say its depth range. Let's see what fish base says. Depth range 10 to 13 meters? That's really shallow. Um, that's actually ridiculously shallow. That's actually concerningly shallow. Um, that's a really tiny range. Uh, that means no refuge at depth. Um, that means this, this species probably runs into a lot of fishing. Lots of fishing pressure. Uh, that's crazy. Um, let's see. Amphidromus. Uh, let me look that up really quick because I wonder... I always get these two confused. There's catadromus and I think anadromus. And these, this refers to fish that... Um, all kinds of fish that like they give birth at sea and then grow in fresh water and then you know return to sea or they give birth in fresh water and then return to sea and then come back to fresh water like famous examples are like salmon salmon's like a really great example of a fish that swims up river to um, give birth and mate like mate and then um, you know like salmon grow in fresh water and then exit and you know enter enter the open ocean so um i'm just wanting to look up amphidromus really quick because i'm not familiar with that one fish that regularly migrate between fresh water and the sea but not for the purposes of breeding so this is like bull sharks okay so that meaning like this shark enters between brackish and marine water but you know, nothing, not not for big life history things. So that's that's a lot like bull sharks. This is actually really cool because um, I thought bull sharks and river sharks were the only sharks that really kind of penetrate fresh water. Um, although there's quite a few sharks that do enter brackish water, and um, but still brackish is very very fresh. So uh, that's interesting. 
So this 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 might be in this kind of rare club of sharks that are able to, you know, enter low salinity environments to access prey items that other shark species can't. So like bull sharks have an advantage on other species like sandbar sharks because they can go further up river. I know I know sandbar sharks enter estuaries, but like um, probably better examples like tiger sharks. Bull sharks have an advantage over other sharks like tiger sharks because bull sharks can enter freshwater areas and exploit prey that tiger sharks can't. Similarly, it looks like the Spain nose shark might have an edge on other species that you know are coastal that can't ascend fresh water. So, um, you know, it's kind of cool to see that this is something that another dimension of how this shark is unique. So. Um, Let's see what we else we have on this website. That's really shallow water though. 10 to 13 meters is nuts. That's like basic scuba diving range. That's really, really small. So got some really cool diagrams on the teeth. So we'll go through these images. Let's see. Rough drawing of the species, but you still see those key features like the flattened snout, the large anal fin. The caudal fin's not looking as dramatic as other drawings or other photos. Oh, I wonder if I can zoom out for a better view of this. No, I can't, so. Oh, actually, no, I can, because I know what I'm doing wrong. There we go. All right, here we go. Uh, Roy, Roy I, just saw, I just saw your uh, comment, oh, wow, that's too shallow. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, oh, <laughs> quackers! No, no, wonky is perfect. <laughs> uh, Roy, the caudal fin reminds me of the taupe shark's caudal. Interesting. Yeah, uh, Howard, it seems prolific. Um, yeah, we should. We should. I, let's check out what the status is, because this is interesting. It's near threatened, which is kind of wild, considering that like it has a small depth range, and you know it's really rubbing up against a lot of fishing pressure but it's not vulnerable it's not endangered it's near threatened so um let's check out really quick why it's like that let's see and although uh the this assessment was published in 2009 and it needs updating let's make absolutely sure that there's not a more recent assessment And, and I don't think there there is, but I just want to make sure. 2009 is very, very outdated. Um, and I think, I forget who, I don't forget if we did this on a stream or if I was talking to like a marine biology buddy, but um, there has been concern about some IUCN red list assessments being outdated. Um, a lot of them have been really, okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, okay. So I, I, I guess this was, I guess I was on an old assessment. I see, okay. I don't know how I got the old one. Sorry about that. All right, so here we go. Uh, Spain no shark, Scolidon laticatus, still near threatened. The population trend is decreasing. Um, this range map is very different from the one we just saw earlier. That's actually, wow. That's actually a lot worse than what we saw earlier. Um, that's a lot more restricted. Because uh, the assessment we saw was 2009, like the first one that I had on the screen was 2009. This one is 20, uh, 2020, published in 2021. Yikes. Uh, so we have the shark in Iran, uh, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, uh, Myanmar, Thailand, Malaysia. But that's really different looking than, like that was a much larger range. Although, um, remember when I said at the top of the stream, there is a new shark, um, a new Scoliodon? Let's double check if that new one, maybe, maybe they divided the species up. Um, yeah, the new Spano shark. I'm curious if the new Spano shark maybe has the, the larger range that we saw earlier. It kind of does, okay. So this is interesting. So this is actually really cool. Um, so this is actually a really great example of why genetics or like, you know, further study on shark species and, you know, like how the species like, you know, like, like how a shark's population works. 
this is a great example of uh, what can happen where originally um, there was one Spain no shark and it looks like it's it was as recently as two, at least 2009 we thought there was one species of Spain no shark across the Indo-Pacific but now uh, there's actually two and they don't occupy the same range so instead of having a shark that looks like it's doing well and like you know, covering a huge amount of habitat, it's actually two different species, each one needing something different as far as like, you know, it's life history, it's, it's, it's um, reproduction strategies, like, like, you know, the, it's habitat use. Um, it looks like the, what is this, the new Spano shark? It looks like the new Spano shark is still nearly threatened. So that's good. It's not as bad as it could be, but yeah, this is wild. So it looks like um, the eastern part of that original range we saw belongs to Scoliodon macrorhynchos. Macrorhynchos is the new Spano shark. So that's the one that's in China, Japan, Indonesia. But the one that we have tonight is the original Spano shark, Scoliodon laticatus. And that apparently does not live there. So there's like a split, a really recent taxonomic split. So. That's crazy, um, but it's it's. I'm really glad that both species are not in too much trouble, but at the same time, like this is a really great case study of like, yeah, this is why genetics are important. This is why population studies are important. You may think you're working with one species, but in the reality, it could actually be two, two separate species that look very, very similar, but they occupy different parts of the world. So that's really wild. Um, yeah, let's check out what's going on with the original Spano shark. Although, curiously enough, um, the original range was in Northeast Africa. So that still could mean, I don't know if that means there's a third species or if the range decreased. So let's check it out. The Spano shark is a small shark that occurs in the Northern Indian Ocean from the Gulf of Oman to Myanmar. It is common in coastal and estuarine waters of depths of 10 to 75 meters. Okay, so it's a little better. It's still really restrictive. It's still really shallow, but that's better than 13. Um, but more typically less than 50 meters and prefers muddy and sandy substrates that often occurs near large freshwater outflows. Interesting. Uh, that's actually really cool because ri river mouths tend to attract a lot of predators. Um, like they tend to be really good areas of a lot of activity. Um, lots of sharks in the Atlantic, um, on the east coast of the U.S., they spend a lot of time at river mouths. Um, so one of my favorites is like bonnet head sharks patrolling, actually a lot of sharks patrolling the Cape Fear River in North Carolina. Um, that outflow is a huge hunting ground for sharks. So, um, so fun fact, Bald Head Island is right there. So for vacationers who want to see a shark, uh, you know, you're welcome. It's there. They're there. They love being there. And for those who don't want to see a shark, well, uh, I won't apologize because they're there. So, <laughs> but anyway, it is highly productive. Okay. Howard was right. It is highly productive with annual large litters of six to 20 pups, early maturation at two years and a short generation length of four and a half years. The species is caught mainly by trawl and gillnet in industrial and artisanal fisheries and is retained for human consumption. Ugh. It is the dominant shark landed in Pakistan, northern India, and Bangladesh, and fishing pressure is intense across most of its range. The high productivity of the species and short generation length likely provide it with resilience to fishing pressure. That's interesting. That's not common as far as sharks go. That's actually a really... This is a shark that bucks the trend of sharks. Like, most sharks are really, really vulnerable to fishing. But this one, the Spano shark, uh, that's kind of amazing that like that's that's really unique as far as sharks go. Um, however, the intense and ongoing fishing pressure of this species is a cause for concern. It is suspected that the Spano shark has undergone a population reduction of 20 to 29 percent over the past three generation lengths and is close to reaching the population reduction threshold due to levels of exploitation and is assessed as near threatened, nearly meeting vulnerable. So still a cause for concern but when you look at 20 and 29 percent and you compare it to a lot of other sharks that are like in the 80s the 90s like you know that's kind of remarkable honestly that it's been able to resist that pressure for so long so this is this is this is interesting as far as like um 
I, there's been an idea about the future of sharks that sharks in general might start become as at least coastal sharks there there might be a selection pressure by humanity to make them smaller whereas like smaller sharks tend to outcompete larger sharks um, in terms of like they are able to grow more quickly reproduce more quickly um, and case in point like this shark is you know in the face of a lot of fishing pressure not doing so bad um, but other sharks like the dusky shark or sandbar shark um, or the sand tiger shark they're really crashing, you know, or hammerheads, hammerheads of all kinds are really crashing and they get to be larger species that occupy a similar, you know, shallow water coastal environment. And, uh, you know, over time, if you have less and less large sharks, uh, that niche starts to get taken over by a bunch of smaller sharks. Um, there have been some, I think I've talked about that before, but there have been some studies about that where they've seen in certain habitats little sharks replacing big sharks because the big sharks open, like they are starting to disappear and they're opening up their niches. So, and then it makes sense also in, a, uh, in the face of like human uh, development and human fishing pressure where um, a quickly reproducing species would outcompete a slow to grow large species. So uh, kind of wild to think about. Um, I think we've talked about before the future of sharks, at least in the shallow water environment might be smaller um, and this, this is a great example of that. Uh, this and the sharp nose shark, um, Rhizoprionodon terranovi, or any Rhizoprionodon, I would imagine, um, you know, those are interesting possibilities as far as, like, the future of sharks, you know. Um, it, you know, if, if, if humanity kind of keeps applying a lot of fishing pressure, keeps consuming keeps exploding in population. Um, I do, I am very curious about that changing as time goes on. There's some, com there's some countries that have like population reduction, like as far as like the, like I think Japan is a very prominent example where, you know, we're starting to enter a phase of like decreasing population. And uh, I'm curious about how that may become a larger thing. It might not. But um, there's certain parts of the world that are really exploding human population. There's other parts in the world that, you know, it's not common, but they're starting to decrease in population. And so it's going to be interesting to see in the next, like, 100 years, like, in the next century, like, how is that going to play out, you know, as far as, like, will fishing pressure start alleviating? Um, or is it going to be consistent? And is, you know, is this going to be, like, the rise of smaller sharks? So interesting thought questions, um, you know you know, things to chew on about that. Um, all these, you know, this kind of field probably be great for, you know, any, any future shark researchers to start studying or looking into. Um, so yeah, uh, going on a tangent a little bit. Uh, let me catch up on the comments. Da, da, da. Time to go to bald head. Yes. Okay. Bald head is awesome. Bald head Island, North Carolina. I highly recommend it. Uh, very cool place. Um, as far as like if you want to be with nature, if you want to be in a place that like there's no cars on the island, um, you leave your cars at like the ferry terminal and uh, the whole island is golf carts. Um, it's a pretty cool location as far as like, um, you know, sharks, sea turtles, alligators, like it's a really interesting place. Uh, so if you're interested in like Carolinian like wildlife, uh, I, I highly recommend it. It's, it's very, very cool. So, um, but uh, yeah, so <laughs> love that quacker is. It's a spade nose you know and love, but now with different genes. Yeah, <laughs> um, like for for any of the new viewers, uh, like because I I know like um, we've talked about the Carolina hammerhead before, but like you know like in the Atlantic, Carolina hammerhead is a huge example of this kind of phenomenon where it looks exactly like a scalloped hammerhead except for a couple vertebrae and the genetics and it's it's a different species uh, so that was discovered only a few years ago where it's like there's two i mean there's a lot of hammerheads on the atlantic east coast of the u.s uh but like the carolina hammerhead is a, is a brand new species that you know was kind of hiding in plain sight so it's an exciting field it's also kind of terrifying as far as like oh no like how many how many sharks have multiple species you know, behind the one name and the one conservation assessment that we're applying. So uh, it's a really cool field though. Um, and uh, again, the biodiversity count keeps going up 
And we get closer and closer to my prediction of a thousand species in the world. I don't know, it's a guess that I have. It's just a gut feeling. I, I have a fun gut feeling it's a thousand, but we'll see. So this is a cool tooth diagram of the spade nose shark. Um, I love, like look at the bottom jaw in figure A, cause those are more narrow, like, uh, you know, those look like really great, like, um, kind of hooking teeth, you know, kind of like mako sharks or sand tiger sharks. Those, that's kind of the vibe I feel with these. Like the top teeth, really good slicing teeth, but the bottom teeth are more like snaring teeth, uh, which is really cool to see. So, uh, nice shout out to um, the symphysis. So, this little tiny tooth at the very end of the jaw is called a symphysis. So um, it's the middle part of a shark jaw or the middle, the middle part of the row of teeth. So um, this, from this symphysis, you have the right side of the mouth. And then um, I, eh, it's hard to tell like what the left side of the mouth is as far as like, cause this is the bottom jaw. And these are two different individuals, but like, um, but like from this, this is the middle point of the jaw if you're looking at the shark head on and then this is the right side of the mouth. So these teeth are in the front of the mouth and then these teeth are in the back of the mouth. So larger teeth up front, smaller teeth in the back. Um, but just fun shout out to Symphysis because I always think that's a really cool little detail um, amongst most if not all sharks. I think most sharks have this feature. I probably shouldn't say all because I think of things like basking sharks. I don't know if they have that. but. Um, cool, uh, I don't know if that's like a, I don't know if I want to say a microscope image because it's like, you know, those are visible. Um, it's just a really nice detailed image of the teeth here. That's a great shot of these, wow. Very cool. Yeah, these are, these are great photographs. And again, you can see that like hooking quality, that spear-like quality. So again, I think this would be pretty great as far as like, you know, um, a, like like hunting for fish, like slippery fish, trying to, trying to make sure that they don't get away. Just like a fishing hook. It's really cool to see in nature, like something, you know, this is analogous to a fishing hook and it, it just, it just works. So it's pretty cool, pretty cool photographs here. Uh, unfortunately, a dead specimen, but um, still you can see the, some of the key features, the flattened snout, the large anal fin. Um, again, that upper lobe of the caudal fin, unusually really big. So an adult male shark, you can tell by the claspers here. Um, I think we all know, but um, just for shark anatomy, uh, male sharks have these features called claspers, um, which deposit sperm. Uh, male sh or female sharks do not have claspers. They have just the cloaca. Um, so it's analogous to like mammals, um, you know, it's not the same thing, but it's kind of like a similar mode of reproduction, like that internal fertilization. It's, it's, it's similar. So a uh, nice shot of the gill slits here. Um, they do look a little larger proportionally than, um, cause some carcharinids, you know, have very tiny gills relative to the body size. Um, these are not, I would not say these look huge, but they do look a little larger. This is a different individual. Again, you can see the larger anal fin, the larger um, upper, caudal, uh, upper caudal lobe, and then the flattened snout there. And nice, look at that. Great image of the jaw. Um, do not want to be bitten by that. Do not want to be bitten by that, so. I like that comment, Roy Roy. Uh, it's like a blend between uh, Mako and Tiger Teeth. So, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah I, I just saw your second comment. I agree. I mean, yeah, pretty pretty much, pretty much. So, I, yeah, pretty much, so. <laughs> but interesting, like really, really beautiful jaw set here. Um, so this is great. Like sometimes this website doesn't have complete jaws, but it's really cool to see that it does have it for um, the spade nose shark. Uh, this is kind of cool. Look at, uh, I don't know if I can zoom in because I always screw that up, but if you can see this tooth right here, look at the bulge right, right out there. So it's like, um, I forget if that's the mesial, mesial end, right? Where it's like, yeah, the distal end is the back part of the tooth. The mesial end is um, 
the tooth that is facing the middle of the mouth. Um, but like, this is actually a really interesting feature because that almost looks like, you know, like, it's like a blade, you know? Like, I know all the teeth are like blades, but like that particular bulge right there uh, almost kind of, it kind of makes me think of like a saw edge. Like, uh, you know, so that's actually really cool that some of the leading edge of the teeth might have extra kick as far as like having a cutting feature. Very cool. Yeah, you can see that here too. Um, really cool tooth type where it's not just like a straight line it's like you know it's curving backwards but the you know the front end of the tooth um it, it does like bulge out and like i would never want to be bitten by the shark like and no one wants to be bitten by any shark but this one in particular that's pretty pretty wicked looking teeth right here um, I've told um, some of our old, older viewers uh, this before, but for some of the newer viewers, um, I had shark jaws. Uh, they're gifted from, I used to work with the Virginia Marine Science, um, and I had a couple jaw sets gifted um, that they just weren't identified and had nowhere else to go. So out of interest, you know, I took them. Um, but while well, cleaning the jaws, like, I, have I have been cut, cut by the teeth before. before. Like, yeah, like, just, like, just like, hand slips. It, it, it is a razor blade. It is. It is. It is. Like shark like shark teeth, no joke. No joke. When they like say, they say it's, it's, it's a razor blade, blade. blade. Like, it's like, not, it's not sensationalism. sensationalism. It's not it's hyping things up. Things up. Like, like shark, shark teeth, teeth are unbelievably sharp. And like, and like any, any species. Any species. Like, like, I mean, I mean, you know, maybe, you know, maybe not, not like something with how much has the flat compression teeth, but any species that has any point, you know, which are most species of sharks, I just always be careful if you handle shark jaws and shark teeth, because it's like. I guess shark, guess shark jaws, because the teeth you can manipulate a little bit better, but shark jaws, like, it's, ugh, yeah, they're, they're sharp. They're, they're unbelievably sharp, so, but anyway, so that's actually a really cool profile on, um, the, um, uh, spade nose shark here. Uh, I don't know if Ice Amaryllis will have more information, so we'll just kind of check to see if there's any notes on the biology. Bigger depth range, um, decreasing population. Here we go. Okay, this is gonna be interesting. Let me take a drink of water. Cause this is a good summary on the species. Oh, <laughs> Quaggers, uh, like Zach Canal brag they got bit by a shark. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. It's a. Uh, I had a weird thing when I was like a kid where it's like, I always thought it'd be cool to have like, you know, like a shark scar, like, like a, like a small bite. And that was, it was like the weirdest thing I had like as a kid where it's just like, you know, I, I, I always felt like it sounded so tough and it's just like, you know, as I've matured as a person, I realized that's one of the stupidest things ever. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I've dove with sharks before. I fortunately have never been bitten by a shark. Uh, fingers crossed that will never happen, uh, but uh, yeah, so. There's no species specific population trends. Fisheries and region have experienced increased demand for sharks since the 70s due to the shark fin trade. Oh no. As a result, effort is increasing in traditional shark fisheries in many areas. That's not good. Um, reports from India indicate that several shark stocks are either declining or have already collapsed. While there is limited spe species-specific information available on the species and region, it is marketed for consumption across its range, and the presence of intensive fisheries mean that, the, like many other sharks in the region, it has declined. Let's see. It is one of the most commonly landed sharks in Pakistan, although over the past 10 years there's been a 30% decline in landings. In India, it's one of the dominant shark species caught in the northern states. Species the most frequently landed shark species in Bangladesh. It's interesting to read read this. I know I keep talking about sharp nose sharks, but like um, we don't have intense fisheries of sharp nose sharks in the U.S. But sharp nose sharks are the most landed species in the U.S. It is it is the most commonly caught species. Um, it used to be dogfish, like pike dogfish or spi or spiny dogfish. But it's shifted to sharp nose sharks, um, and it kind of this kind of reminds me of that, where 
um, you know, completely different ocean, but like this is this is like the number one. It's kind of analogous a little bit. It's like this is the number one species um, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, Spano shark, uh, very common. Again, very strange. I can't find any uh, video footage on YouTube of the species. I mean, in light of how common it is, but. Uh, this species is mainly taken as bycatch of the Hilsa shad, drift gillnet fishery. That's kind of interesting. Um, shad are very, I don't know about this species it, specifically, but shad are pretty famous um, estuarine fish that enter, um, you know, like freshwater environments or brackish water environments from the ocean. So I, I, that's really interesting that, you know, we talked about the shark being more of a brackish water shark and, um, you know, like it being a bycatch of shad, a shad fishery, that makes sense where it's like these two animals live in a similar environment as far as like, you know, kind of bouncing between like seawater and, you know, brackish water or estuarine water. So that's interesting. Although landings data are not a direct measure of abundance, these could be used to infer population reduction where landings have decreased while fishing effort has remained stable or increased. Hmm. This species is likely to be resilient enough to withstand moderate fishing mortality and there may be localized stability in catch trends. With increasing fishing pressure across the Indian Ocean region, it is suspected the species has declined by 20 to 29 percent over the past three generation lengths, 14 years, and is close to reaching the population reduction threshold due to levels of exploitation. Ugh. Habitat ecology. Let's see. Spider shark is demersal. Demersal kind of means like likes to stick close to the bottom in coastal and estuarine waters. Da, 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 da. It prefers muddy and sandy substrates that often occur near large freshwater outflows. Breeding occurs throughout the year and females probably mate at least once each year. Interesting. Litters are six to 20, so that's a little bit larger than the fish base assessment we saw with a mean of 13. And young are born throughout the year after a gestation period of five to six months. That's really short. Wow, so five to six months uh, gestation period, so like kind of like equivalent of pregnancy, like that's really short. So this is really, uh, as far as like biology is concerned, this is a very successful shark. Um, you know, I know it's near threatened and I, knew, I know there's concern about it being vulnerable, but um, just as far as like its life strategy goes, that's a very, um, that's a very resilient shark to fishing pressure, so. Very cool to, uh, to see that, because it's not common. Female age of maturity is around two years, and maximum age is seven years. Generation length is therefore 4.5 years. Again, very, very rapid as far as sharks go. That's that's kind of crazy. Man. So there's a lot of, there is a lot of information on a species, which is really cool. Even though there's not much footage, uh, there's a lot of research. Uh, we're checking fish base to see if there's any more core facts we can learn. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. Uh, found on rocky substrates and coastal waters and lower reaches of tropical rivers. It is uncertain, however, if the species can live in perfectly fresh water for extended periods. Forms large schools. Uh, I think, Howard, you mentioned that earlier, which is really cool. Adults feed on small bony fishes, shrimps, and cuttlefish. So this is really cool to see because all of these are uh, soft-bodied animals. So uh, bunny fishes, shrimp, and cuttlefish, they're not um, like crabs or mollusks. And it's really cool to see that because the tooth type, like the tentition on the species, it's just these cutting blades and like, um, you know, like fish hook teeth. So it's really cool to see that we kind of had that guess in the beginning that that's what it eats. And, you know, here you go. Um, bony fish, shrimp, and cuttlefish, you know, all like, you know, soft, like they don't have like a hard molluscan shell or anything, so, or a hard, like, like a crab shell. So that's, that's really cool. Let's see. Common bycatch of inshore uh, demersal gillnet fisheries, particularly those operating off 
Kalimantan. Processed into fish meal, utilized fresh for human consumption, uses bait for other sharks. Yeah. Max size is 120 centimeters. That is about three feet, if I'm doing the conversion correctly. Uh, so to feet. I think it's about three feet. I don't know why. I don't know why America has feet. I don't get it. It's not right. But <laughs> like four feet. There we go. Four feet. So uh, 120 centimeters or four feet. So nice, nice little shark. So. See if there's any other photos. I'm gonna catch up on comments as well. Let's see. Uh oh. So a couple interesting photos. This might be I oh, know that's not what I thought. Um Like, I, I hate showing, like, dead shark photos, but I do want to show any any photos that might be more diagnostic, so... Um, this one is interesting, actually. That's really interesting. Um, so you notice in this photo, this individual definitely looks a lot stockier. Um, you know how we've been talking, or like how the descriptions have been saying this is a stocky shark. Um, you know, based on the illustrations, I never really got that impression. But in this particular photo, yeah, you can see that stockiness. You still see that diagnostic, you know, long anal fin, um, large upper lobe of the caudal fin, and then the very flat snout. Um, but that's interesting. This one has a bit more uh, girth to him, which is kind of interesting. Um, this one... I'm gonna skip over the gross photos, so that one's a little blurry. Although you can still, sorry, you can still kind of see that really flat snout. Um, and again, the, the dorsal fin is kind of curving backward, or like, um, it, it's not like a 90 degree angle, like on the, on the trailing edge. It's really kind of more like closer to 45, which is kind of cool. Because, again, river sharks, they have that feature as well. So, uh, Last photo from here, and we'll move on. Uh, these are a little bit more damaged. Um, but, again, you can just see some of the key fin features. So, um, I don't like dead shark photos, but, um, you know, sometimes it could be helpful as far as, like, you can clearly see some unique features of the species that are diagnostic, so... Um, all of these, again, it's a heavily fished shark, so all of these from, um, you know, this website usually has a lot of good photos, but all of these are like fishing photos. I'm trying to see if there's any that is of the species in life, and unfortunately there's not. Um, I wonder how much of that is related to its habitat, where it lives in muddy uh, waters near river mouths. Um, that probably, you know, kind of makes it very difficult to photograph. Um, cause that kind of, those kind of turbulent areas, you know, they, they cause a lot of turbidity or like murky water. So this photo is a little blurry, but this is probably the closest we'll get to like a living photo of the shark, unfortunately. So I think this is the main picture from fish base too. Yep. That's the main one. Let's see if that's a higher resolution. Oop. Oop. This is a fun old website. Am I able to get into this? Nope. I, if I click on it, I get into this website. So maybe I can zoom in on that. Okay. Oh, interesting. Um, like, uh, Roy Roy, I wonder how concentrated is your Amphili Lorenzini? Is your snout? Um, yeah, uh, that's a really cool question. Um, Oh, Howard, it's seen strictly as a commodity for the most part. It makes sense just with like the fishing pressure and the, the, um, the map, like, like the, uh, what's the word? Just the, the massive amount of landings, um, you know, and this being the number one species in Pakistan and India, like it makes sense that, um, you know, it's seen as a commodity. 
But Roy, Roy, this is a really cool question because, um, you know, Hammerheads, which famously have like a higher count of Ampullae Lorenzini, um, you know, they like also occupy shallow coastal environments. Some of the some of the smaller ones like bonnethead sharks or like mallethead sharks, you know, it's a very similar niche to this species, the spano shark. So that's a good question. I'm kind of curious if, um, you know, <laughs> I, uh, I'm very curious about, um, I just saw Quacker's comment. So we'll, we'll look at the anatomy photos really quick. Um, so, um, but I, I am very curious. So like, as we go through the research tonight, um, let's keep an eye out for ampul any mention of the Ampullae Lord Xena to see if there's anything about like, are they higher? Or is there any advantage to that Spain nose? Um, so Quackers, uh, let's see, no anatomy photos or gross photos, bring on the guts. We can do that. So let's do a content war warning. If anyone is like uncomfortable with sh anatomy or shark anatomy, um, you know, uh, look away. Uh, you know, because there, I think this was on fish base. Um, so we'll we'll take a look. We'll take a look. Uh, I will indulge quackers. So <laughs> um, I mean, because anatomy is interesting. Um, I'm not sure what this is because I'm not as good with. Um, shark and oh okay gotcha okay i think i know what this is so um and again if people are squeamish uh please look away content warning this is a little gross but like um so for this photo um that is a embryo or young young shark uh, pretty well developed at the bottom of the photo meaning i think these are ovaries so um like that makes sense as far as like so these are ovaries of a female shark a uh, female spano shark so Gotcha. Um, so that's what that is. And as, you know, unpleasant as that is, I don't really want to click on the other photos. I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I don't want to click on the other photos now that I know what this is. Um, as unpleasant as a, that is, um, it is important if there is like a landed female shark and um, you're able to, you know, dissect it. It is important to get a guess of its reproductive strategy of how many pups it can produce of you know what is the possibility of like what is the biological possibility of the species you know as really gross as it is um it's not uh what's the word it's not without utility as far as like if there is a, a landed uh species especially for rare species if a shark is already dead uh you know as far as like it was just a victim of bycatch um, you know, and a scientist is able to collect a specimen, uh, it's important to do things like dissection. Um, and like with ovaries in particular, um, that is very helpful as far as, um, you know, kind of helping to determine how many pups can the shark have? Like, you know, is there anything we could tell about the um, anatomy to indicate like, can these pups grow quickly or not so quickly? So. I'm not as good about anatomy as I am like ecology, but um, you know, but it is it is a valid field. So we're gonna move on. But um, I, I hope you enjoy that quackers. <laughs> like as far as you know, um, and and like shark anatomy is really important. Um, I just uh, I, I think I, I think we there's a lot of papers to review. So um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I just saw that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, I just saw your comment. That's seriously quackers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm I'm gonna star that. That's a, that's an excellent comment. So, and Roy, Roy, it's for science. Yeah. Actually, you know what's really funny? I love the capital letters because it's like it makes me think of Indiana Jones. Like it belongs in me in a museum. So, <laughs> um, oh my goodness. So okay, it looks like mo most most of the viewers are actually okay with the anatomy. Okay, cool. So it looks like we we. That's awesome. I actually, I actually really appreciate that. So, <laughs> um, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I saw the new Indiana Jones and I liked it. You know, it's, it's fine. It's, it's not my favorite one, but I really liked it. I, I, if anybody was, it's the dial of destiny. Like it's, it, it was pretty fun. So it's always fun to watch indie. Um, if anyone has Disney plus, uh, all the Indiana Jones movies are on there and young Indiana Jones, uh, super fun series that I really like. It's got some slow episodes, but there's some really fun, um, really cool, like, mini adventures uh, that young indie does. So uh, I, I highly recommend it. But anyway, 
So now, uh, it's actually really cool that we're starting this at 10, because I think it gives us plenty of time to bounce around time itself. Uh, it's kind of fun to hear uh, the music shift, where we went from like ancient era Civ music to like, I think this is Renaissance era Civ, but here we go. Uh, the first interesting little paper uh, is from the Smithsonian, Washington, D.C. And it's a revision of the Carcharanid shark genera Scolidon, Loxodon, and Rhizoprionodon. So Scolidon is a spano shark, Rhizoprionodon is a shark no shark, Loxodon, I forget what that one is, but let's, let me see if I can look that up really quick. I, I think we literally, the slit eye shark, okay, slit eye shark is Loxodon, so. Okay, so we'll just kind of scan through this. And uh, I'll probably be a little bit quieter as I'm reading. Um, so just a heads up for that. And if I go quiet, it's just because I'm scanning and reading. So let's see. Um, da, 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 da. The purpose of the paper is revive the genera Scullydon, Loxodon, Rise, and Proudon. The most recent studies allocate all the species including this report to a single genus, Scullydon. It is for this reason, together with their superficial resemblance to each other, that the three genera are treated together. Interesting. While these genera do not seem to form a natural group, judgment of the relationship is deferred until the other genera of the family Carcharinidae are more completely known. This is interesting. So if I'm reading that correctly, did are we thinking that sharp no sharks and spade no sharks are like one thing? Um, again, this is from 1964, so this is very old uh, as far as like you know research goes. So let's see. Uh, among the three genera, Scolidon is quite distinct from the other two and easily distinguishable from all other Carcharanidae. Um, why, why this is interesting is that currently Scolidon is classified as Carcharinidae, so it is classified in that Requiem shark family. But it's kind of cool to see, like, you know, some doubt about that, where it's like, is this unique enough to be its own thing? So, and it's certainly, like, it's, it's certainly proven itself to be pretty different from a lot of the other sharks that we've seen so far. Um, and also, uh, whoever picked this last week, and I apologize, um, but like for, I, I, off the top of my head, I, I don't remember who picked it last week, but this is a great choice. So thank you for suggesting the Spano shark, because this is a really, really good choice. Um, it's, it's definitely a unique species, so. Let's see, Loxodon and Rhizocranon are probably closely related. Okay. It's kind of cool to read uh, a paper like this, by the way, because, and this, this is actually like, I think a, an actual like book. Oh yeah, because this is like 700 pages, wow. Um, but it's really cool to read it because like, you know, this is pre-internet, like pre, like this is how you did research as far as like, you know, if you didn't conduct research yourself, like you would ask for a copy of this or like go to, you know, a marine science library to pour through this and see what we know. Um, so it's really cool to see something like this, where it's like, this is, this was, still is a, a really important source of information, so. Okay. I won't dwell too much on like super specific anatomical things because um, that can take forever. So I'm gonna be mindful of time. Oh, this is cool. Uh, several species assigned to the genus Scolidon have been described from fossil teeth. Uh, I choose not to treat them here because I, I'm not sure who this author is. Um, sorry, let's go back to who is the author of this? Victor G. Springer. So Springer is a pretty big shark name, actually. So that's really cool. So Victor Springer. Okay, 
I chose not to treat him here as I believe the affinities of fossils based only on teeth are at present indecipherable and possibly will remain so in most cases. Oh, this viewpoint is based on the close similarity of teeth while li within the living genera included in the present study, as well as a similarity to the teeth of the distantly related Sphernidae. So those are the hammerhead sharks. Interesting. Uh, the problem is further confused by the here heretofore unrecognized dental sexual dimorphism that is found in several carcharinids, including Rhizoperiodon and Scoliodon. Wait a minute. So male and female... Spano sharks have different teeth? Wait a minute. Hold on. Uh, didn't we see... Wasn't there a, a picture somewhere? Let's check this figure again. Okay. Mature male from India, right upper and lower teeth. Uh, female from India, right upper and lower teeth. Okay, so figure A is a male, figure B is a female. Let's see if there's any different. Look at this. Whoa, okay. Oh, I didn't notice this before. Look at this. So figure A, males. Male have like, male, male Spano sharks have these like hook-like teeth, but female Spano, Spano sharks don't. Oh, that is wild. Okay, this shark is unique, like in so many ways. Wow. This is one of the weirdest sharks we've ever seen. I can't believe I never caught that before. Uh, yeah, look at this. Like the males have like more of like the hook-like teeth, but the females have more of like the blade-like teeth. Wow, that's interesting. So um, some preliminary guesses, like you know, size differences maybe. Like you know, because you know, across most sharks, if not all sharks, females tend to be larger than males. So um, it could be that females. Like, at least as far as, like, this little guy, like, maybe the females are just large enough to handle larger prey than the males. Another guess would be that maybe this is part of mating, where we know that male sharks tend to bite female sharks' pectoral fins um, as they mate. And I'm wondering if, like, maybe part of the hook-like teeth could help with that for male sharks. But sexual dimorphism, I always think that's so cool in sharks, because uh, it's, like, not really... I don't think it's very common... Um, as far as like, you know, having additional characteristics, like, like I've talked about sand devils, like, which are kind of angel shark have, males have spiky fins, females have sp smooth fins. Um, but like for this guy, this is wild. Like having your, the, the teeth be different is, is kind of radical actually. So that is really cool. All right. So Spano sharks have different teeth between the genders. So, um, between male and female sharks, that's really cool. Wow, let me catch up in the comments, because that's crazy. Yeah. That's really cool. Uh, Howard, females are larger and, the, and thus each larger prey. That's a good guess. That is a really good guess, because I'm wondering if there is like, you know, at, even though these, guys, these sharks are pretty small, like, you know, it's an interesting question is like, you know, could the difference between, so in, the, in this example, this is 378 millimeter, oh no, 378 millimeters, 30, no, that cannot be right. 460 millimeters, 38 centimeters versus 46 centimeters, I can't, that's really small. No, that's, no, this is the teeth, sorry, they're talking about the teeth, sorry. No, but the point being, um, you know, say like a male uh, Spano shark is like three feet, Female spano, spano shark is four feet. That's a good question in terms of like, is that large enough? Like, is that difference great enough where it's like, oh, the female shark can handle, can enter a larger prey group, like as far as like, you know, cuttlefish or like larger fish, like lar lar larger prey items that you know benefit more from like that slicing action, um, as opposed to like um, smaller fish that you know it would be more useful to have like the, the hook-like teeth, but. I think it could be that. I also think like mating could be part of it too, but that's wild. That is really not common as far as sharks go. So that's really cool to see sexual dimorphism for this. Um, let's see. It's found in several crocodiles. Riser Riser have sexual dimorphic teeth. I never knew that before. So sharp sharks have se sexual dimorphic teeth. Okay. 
I love this quote, relationships presently based only on teeth, therefore are open to question. Um, I think, I think for our fossil viewers, uh, this is, this is a great quote because, you know, there's so many different kinds of teeth. Like it's so tricky to classify sharks based on teeth. So, um, yeah, I kind of love that quote. Uh, Scolidon, Loxodon, and Resoprodon are distributed primarily through the shallow tropical marine waters of the world with some form strain over moderate depths and into temperate areas. None of the species is known to occur in the Mediterranean or in Oceania. Oh no, okay. All the species with possible exceptions of Rhizoprodon and Terranovi, which is the Atlantic sharpening shark, um, and Rhizoprodon taylori are used commonly as food and one Scoliodon laticatus is considered a delicacy. Oh, that's really gross. But it's important information to know. Like, so Spano sharks, it's not just that they're, you know, for sustenance, they're also a delicacy. That's crazy. Um, the two exceptions noted should be edible also, but they have received little attention as food, possibly because of local prejudice in the areas where they occur. Yeah, interesting. I'm not sure where Rhizoprod and Taylori are, but in the States, um, I think we used to eat sharks, but that's not something, that's not a thing really. Like, um, and I think part of it is because a lot of sharks just don't taste great, uh, just with the high urea content. Another part of it, we're becoming increasingly aware of like, oh yeah, sharks being the top of the food chain accumulate a lot of methylmercury or, um, you know, just other toxic compounds because like, you know, they eat everything below them that also accumulate toxins or pollutants from the environment. So it's just like, you know, sharks concentrate that in their meat. So like, yeah, it's not, it's not a thing really. Like eating sharks here is not really a thing. So that makes sense that the Atlantic shark, no shark, which is like an American species is like, it's not really something that people want to eat, so. Um, let's see. Radiographs. Um, so, I'm just kind of quickly scanning through this, but it looks like um, in this study, they have some x-rays or radiographs of the shark. Here we go, yeah. This is very cool. Loxodon maxo macrorhinus. Sorry, so that's the slit eye shark. I'll, I'll flip this over once we find our shark. Rhizoprion terranovi, the Atlantic sharpnose shark. Uh, looks like they don't have Scoliodon. They don't have the Spano shark. So we might move on. This looks like a spade nose shark. Yeah. Okay. So they don't they don't have a radiograph, but they do have a nice drawing of the spade nose shark. So let's see if I can flip this around so we can get a better view of this. Oh, Howard! Excellent question. Do they school separated by gender? That's an excellent question because other shark species do, you know, like a uh, famous example are uh, spiny dogfish or pike dogfish. Um, they have sexually segregated schools. Um, so it's like juvenile school together, adult females are on their own. Um, I think adult males school with immature females, if I'm not mistaken. So that's a really great question as far as this shark um, having sexually dimorphic teeth. I don't know. I mean, like, like you know, that's an excellent question. Like, do the males and females tend to occupy different, like, niches or like, like, not school together, or do they school together? Excellent question. So, let's see. Uh, this is loading in a second. I do want to get a closer look at this diagram because this is actually a really cool image. Identifying the key features, so you can see. There we go. That's there we go. So again, that really flattened snout, the very large anal fin, um, the pretty large uh, upper caudal lobe. So Scolidon laticatus, uh, mature male from Singapore. 
And there's the teeth, and there you go. Yeah. Oh, this is actually, this is the, wow, okay. So this is the same image from sharkreferences.com. So same image right here. Um, so this is where they pulled it from, which is really cool. Let's go back to this. So uh, the male having, um, you know, those like really pointed teeth right here, like the hook-like teeth at the top, figure A, and then the female having more blade-like teeth in figure B. Very cool. All right, let's move forward in time because there's a lot of, I do have a lot of papers to check on. So let's see. Age and growth of the yellow dog shark. Uh, again, hate that name, but Scolidon laticatus uh, from Bombay waters. So let's see. Um, age and growth of the Spano shark from Bombay waters have been studied by length frequency method. Da, 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 da. Just kind of scanning this. There is no difference in the growth rate of males and females. Females grow to a larger size and to an older age than the males. Okay, so there we go. Um, so confirm, uh, just like a lot of shark species, females are larger uh, than their, you know, than males. Growth is more or less slow in the case of other sharks. That's kind of a weird statement, just because it's like again, you know, we know that this species actually grows pretty quickly uh, compared to other sharks and is able to withstand fishing pressure really well compared to other sharks. Let's see. Uh, the maximum length of the shark in Bombay waters is about 660 millimeters, so that's really small. Uh, over the 75% of the landings were in the age group of two to four years, ranging from 380 to 530 millimeters. So, uh, converting that to feet, again, I hate feet, but we got feet, we got feet. Uh, what we got? 660. Two feet. Okay. So it's about two feet. So half the maximum size. So this paper is from 1976. Okay. Just kind of scanning through. Seeing if there's any cool figures. I'm kind of amazed that, like, I thought that without footage, you know, like we would really fill like the two hours tonight, but honestly, like it's it, there's so much on this species. Uh, it's really cool uh, that there's like so much research and so much information um, on the Spano shark. So, gotcha. All right, we'll kind of hop forward to the 80s. 1988 length weight relationship of Scolidon laticatus. And Carcharinus lumbatus, so the black black tip shark, from Dakshina Kanada coast. Okay, length weight relationships of two shark species were derived based on random samples from commercial catches of Mangalore, Malpe, and Gingoli landing centers. The relationships were compared between sexes separately for each species, and it was found that the relationships did not differ significantly. Both the species were found to exhibit isometric growth pattern. I guess it's kind of interesting because I don't think black tip sharks. I, I, I've never heard, I've never thought of black tip sharks as like quick to grow, you know, so it's kind of interesting the studies. Let's see. Catching up on comments. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, Civ 3 music is awesome. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, oh, Howard, uh, thank you, 2.5 feet, yeah. Thank you, like, uh, as far as the conversion goes. Again, I say it a lot, but a lot of, like, I don't know other country, I don't know if the United Kingdom has weird measurements too. American measurements are the worst. I don't understand them, they make no sense, and I wish we were all metric, so, you know, there I said it. <laughs> like, but, um, yeah, no, this music, like, the Civ, Civ 3, Civilization 3, fantastic music, uh, I, I, I love that that bop as well like like that, that that's one of my favorites honestly like in the whole soundtrack so um let's see kind of want to keep going because i want to find something just to be mindful of time that has some cool figures or at least like a species profile uh, again weight length weight relationship and food and feeding habits of spano shark uh 1989 let's see The shark prefers to feed on prawns during the uh, pre-monsoon and monsoon periods and on fishes during the 
post-monsoon period. Now this is cool. Okay, so this is from P. Devados from the Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute in Cochin, India. So, and I could be mistaken. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. I think Cochin and Kochi are used interchangeably, but because um, I was reading like old bull shark papers a couple years ago uh, from the same institute, so I think they're used independently, inter like like interchangeably. But please let me know if I'm wrong about that. So, um, but anyway. The length-weight relationship of Scoliodon laticatus was calculated for males and females separately, since regression coefficients in respect to sexes were significant. This shark prefers to feed on prawns during the pre-monsoon and monsoon periods, and on fishes during the post-monsoon period. A change in the feeding habit of the shark is seen when it attains adolescence. Starvation of females above 350 millimeters during pregnancy is also observed. This is really interesting. So let's scan this. And that's really cool to see, like, you know, seasonal changes in diet. So I'm assuming it's just corresponding to, like, you know, abundance, where, like, maybe the prawns... I'm not really good with invertebrates or, like, um, you know, prawns, you know, but, like, uh, it's kind of cool to think about, like, you know, do they have, like, a growth explosion during, like, the pre-monsoon, monsoon period? Um, and then they, you know, when they die off, the shark shifts and subsists on something else? Um, it's really cool. Spanish shark is one of the smallest tropical carcaran sharks um, occupy mostly shallow regions of the coastal waters. Do, 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 do. This is kind of cool. Uh, apparently there was another species, Scoliodon soracoa, which is now considered to be Scoliodon laticatus. So it looks like there was a time we thought there were two species, then it shifted back to one species, and then now it's back to two species. So, very interesting. Okay, just kind of scanning this. This is kind of cool. Feeding intensity is determined on the basis of the condition of stomach as empty, half, full, and gorge. The occurrence of empty stomachs in good proportion all the months of the year. Now, saying the incidence of starvation was more during July to October. Uh, correspondingly, the full and gorge stomachs were significantly less during... Oh, this is cool. We'll go back to that in a little bit. Sorry, I just want to get to the other part of... Uh, I guess... I guess that cut off in an awkward place, but let's go back to that chart, because that was a really cool chart. Okay, here we go. So this diagram is showing um, fish is kind of like this top stripy part. Mollusks are the uh, vertical bars, uh, prawns are the black bars, and then other crustaceans are the horizontal bars. So in January, kind of an even distribution, February, March, prongs start to kind of like die off a little bit, and then fish starts to supplement the diet more. Then April, May, June, July, August, huge influx of prawns. Um, and so the shark, you know, primarily predates on them. And then again, it kind of dies off September, October, November. And then I'm kind of blocking this view. December, it starts to come back again. So this is super cool to see seasonal changes in, um, you know, just the shark's diet. Um, this is a very, like, malleable species as far as, like, you know, just adapting to the different conditions of its environment. It's kind of cool to see in February, look at that, a huge proportion of the diet is mollusks. Um, you know, so that would include cuttlefish. Uh, cuttlefish is a mollusk, so, um, I know we mentioned earlier that they have, um, cuttlefish in their diet, so. And then September, same thing, huge increase in mollusks in September. Oh no, yeah, yeah, mollusks. So the group that seems to be more or less low are other crustaceans, so interesting. Very cool chart, so really, really liking the study. Oh hey, uh, see you later Quackers, thank you for joining, uh, it was great to see you. Um, I just saw your comment, but um, oh hey! hey. Minjus, I think I learned from a previous team that pirates stole the metric system. Someone in the chat said, I think. That's really cool. Yeah. Very cool. So, 
But yeah, uh, thank you, thank you for being on Quackers. That was that, it was really great to see you. So um, that kind of reminds me, since it's almost ten thirty, um, if anyone has a suggestion for next week's shark, please leave a comment below. Um, please leave multiple suggestions. Uh, just because we, we this is episode sixty one. We've done 61 sharks already, so now we're starting to get to a point where it's like, oh yeah, we got to be like, we might have, we might have dupes. So, um, like, although there are again, 500 sharks, uh, I think right now we have 480 to go. <laughs> but um, yeah, so but please leave a comment, multiple comments on the shark that you want to see next week. Um, and I'd love to see what you have. And I have no suggestions this week because um, this one, the Spano Shark, kind of, uh, this was one of your suggestions and it's awesome. This, this has been a really fun species to study tonight. So, okay. I'll kind of move on to be mindful of time. 1991, uh, like, very good year. Shark fishery of Verval Coast with special reference to population dynamics of. Scolidon laticatus and Rhizoprion acutus. So we'll just kind of scan this really quick. Do, 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 do. Just want to see if there's any cool notes. And we've worked, we've learned a lot already. Sexually dimorphic teeth, preference for prawns, uh, enters fresh water or not fresh water, but like brackish water, estuarine water. Uh, very resilient to fishing pressure. This is a cool, cool shark. The, oh, okay, here we go. This is interesting. The males... Oh, I'm sorry. This is not the same species. Um, but this is kind of a cool quote. The males of um, a sharp nose shark they're studying are exposed to moderately higher fishing pressure, whereas the females are not. So that, that kind of tells me that maybe like the schools of that species are sexually segregating a little bit. So... Let's see. Okay, uh, the sex-wise yield per recruit studies of both species indicate that both sexes of the spano shark is not exposed to high fishing intensity, and the effort to troll and gillnet may be increased to exploit the species more effectively without further reduction in the age of first capture from prevailing level. That's interesting. Um, this is the same institute from Koshin, different author, H. Mohammed Kasim, shark fishery of Veraval Coast with special reference to population dynamics of the Spano shark and the rise of Paradon acutus. So is the Verval Coast one of those few fisheries that might be more resilient? Cause it's a little it's a little odd to see that like, oh, we're not really catching a lot of Spano sharks, so we could maybe exploit them more, is kind of the gist of that line. Ugh, it's a little creepy as far as like uh you know, it's always good to be cautious around sharks, you know. But every shark is different, but but again, like kind of generally, most sharks really sensitive to fishing pressure, so um let's move forward to discussion, because I want to learn more about any kind of conclusions on this. Growth curves, oh, a lot of growth curves and uh, mortality coefficients. Let's see. Oh, references. This is weird. I, this is really not common to see. Um, and I'm, I'm a little hesitant about this, but there's scope to increase the shark production further by increasing the age at first capture as close to the optimum weight as close to the optimum age of exploitation as possible by manipulating the selection property of trawl and gill nets operated off of variable. Uh, however, increasing the age at first capture means enlarging the mesh size, which is not possible under the prevailing circumstances as the main aim of these two gears is to exploit some other resources and sharks form only a bycatch in these gears. Interesting. Okay, so what this is saying is that we could exploit the Spano shark, but we want to select for the larger individuals, not the smaller ones. Again, I'm not a big fan of that, just because it's like, even though the shark does really well and is resilient against fishing pressure, I'm like, 
the sharks as a rule are very sensitive and really I don't think we're in an age where we should encourage, you know. But again, it's different because like every uh, like every country is different in terms of like, you know, this is this is a subsistence this is a food item. I mean, this this shark does play a role in subsistence for you know, different different places and it's just like, you know, like in the United States, sharks are not food really. You know, we have like tuna or like salmon or like you know, like it's just like I don't know haddock. Whereas here, this particular species is treated more like actual food. So, it gets tricky. It gets tricky because it is it is doing well compared to other sharks as far as resisting fishing pressure. But um, it's it's just I guess the point being it's kind of unusual for me to see a study supporting further exploitation for a shark. Um, so. Very interesting to see that, actually. Um, I personally don't like it, but again, I'm not... Every country is a different situation as far as, like, resource use, resource management, and, you know, how, like, are there shark species that might be, like, you know, might sustain have a sustainable fishery? Um, so this is 1991. Um, you know, so it's just like over 30 years ago, it's like, like right now, it's a near threatened shark. So I don't, I don't know, I don't know. This is, this is an interesting article to kind of chew through, so. The other thing to consider, by the way, is even if you are trying to harvest larger individuals, you do get into that tricky territory of like, are you harvesting like females are you harvesting pregnant individuals like larger sharks you know growing to that ma maturity like you know is that gonna you know negatively affect the population in general so yeah interesting i'm gonna keep moving on just to be mindful of time also i'm gonna catch up on comments yeah like like i, I just saw your comment i i like i, I agree minjus i kind of feel like um I'm, I'm kind of reading that as like a yeah like it's it's always tricky because it's like most sharks are not doing well sharks in general are just like very slow to reproduce slow to grow so it's just kind of like uh, you don't it's not ideal to recommend harvesting them but this is a uniquely resilient species and it's in the part of the world that like you know, is subsisting on it. So this gets into that tricky dynamic of like, you know, it gets weird. It gets weird because again, even if you're like selecting for the larger individuals, you are selecting for like pregnant individuals. And like, that is a vital part of like making sure that the whole fishery is okay. And it's just like, I don't know. It's just interesting to chew over. So we'll kind of keep going. Uh, the biology population dynamics of the Spano shark in the coastal waters of Maharashtra state, India. Let's see, I'll kind of scan this. It's kind of cool to see, we don't really see, um, this This is probably the highest proportion of um, Indian uh, papers, like Indian research um, that we've seen so far. Um, and like India is actually like very pro prolific in shark research. Um, like United States, Australia, India, um, I want to say Japan, uh, South Africa, like um brazil i think as well like major players as far as shark research goes um canada uh shout out to the canadians uh has some really cool uh studies on like you know especially like in the um the um oh my gosh the atlantic provinces i think is the right name for like the east coast uh please correct me if i'm wrong but a lot of cool studies on sharks that you know have a higher temperature or sorry a, a higher tolerance for lower temperature um so a lot of cool research there but the point being is like there is a lot of um, interesting research from India as far as um, sharks go, and you know, no wonder uh, there's a lot of unique species like, you know, in like the Indian Ocean um, and like you know, like the Indian coastline. So I think we actually have a guide. One of these is a guide from India, so we'll check that in a little bit. But I do want to read this abstract before moving on. 
No evidence of cannibalism, uh, so it's pretty interesting. Um, some Carcharina sharks are cannibalistic. Bull sharks are cannibalistic, um, which is scary. But, um, but it looks like Spanish sharks are not, so. Uh, oh, interesting. So this particular study is from 1997, so this is six years after the other study. The study of the dynamics of Spanish sharks indicates that the stock is exploited at its optimal level. Therefore, any increase in effort from the present level may not increase the yield and is advisable to sustain the effort at the present level. Okay, this is interesting. So in the past study from 1991, they were saying we want to increase exploitation. In this study from 1997, we're like, okay, we've, we've done it. We are at the level that is optimal. We do not want to fish more for the species. We don't want to fish less, but we don't want to fish more. That's actually pretty interesting. It's cool to see this fishery management history. For the sharks, all species combined, and the Lazarinx, there's some scope for increasing the effort in order to reach the MSY level. Very interesting study. Hmm. Okay, it's already 1040. That's crazy. We'll keep going. What is this one? 1998, growth and population parameters of Spano shark from Calicut Coast. Females grow larger and live longer than males. Makes sense. The overall sex ratio is 1 to 1.31, with females predominating. Interesting. More so from 551 to 600 millimeter size group onwards. The average estimated annual catch was 14 tons. Lots of fisheries research on the species. It's really cool to see it, you know, like, um, just to access it, because I don't think we've seen as much. This is from P. Devados. Uh, same same thing, Madras Research Central, uh, uh, sorry, Center of Central Marine Fisheries. Oh, I'm sorry. I think it's the same institute, but different city. Um, Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute, but this one is in Madras, so. It's cool to see so much research on this species. Yeah, I agree. I just saw your comment, Minjus. It's like, I can't understand the circumstance of using this food, but it's just it, it just feels sort of wrong. I, I agree. It's like, I mean, it's tricky because, um, like, yeah. <laughs> Oh, hey, I'm sorry, I have a nerd, uh, 10 for you, I just saw your comment. Um, yeah, so, like, uh, thank you so much for joining. Um, I was just going to say, it's tricky because, like, um, and this is kind of the heart of, there was a very controversial documentary called Seaspiracy um, a couple years ago, and it kind of gets to the heart of this, where it's like, that documentary was really gunning hard for, like, you, you really shouldn't be fishing because it's so destructive for the ocean. You really should be eating fish because it's so destructive to the ocean. But one of the counter-arguments was, like, hey, some cultures really need this as their protein. Like, some cultures really need to exploit fisheries, you know, in order to survive. It's, it's subsistence. And this shark, is, it, yeah, it gets tricky because it's, like, I really, really, really do not want to ever support exploitation of sharks. But also, a am I in a position to say that when I live in an area where I don't need to eat sharks to be okay? Like, you know, like, are, are there parts of the world that like, yeah, this is a really vital part of, you know, like, act, like subsistence, or is this a really vital part of like, you know, like, just, just, I mean, food, you know, for, for a certain culture. So it's just like, it's tricky. It, this is a really cool species to kind of like have that debate and like kind of like put it at the center of the debate. It's like, you know, it's a shark. Sharks are not doing well. Should we advocate for it to like be let go? Or is it really our place to do that? Because it's like, we're not, li we don't live in this part of the world as far as like, it might be a really vital part of food. So it's a really cool shark for the center of, uh, of that kind of discussion. And it's a very important discussion for fisheries around the world. So, but um, I know you gotta go, but thank you so much for joining Minjus. Um, and I hope you have a great uh, lecture. Um, yeah, <laughs> I can't believe how fast time flew by either. Like, uh, I, I love that comment. So thank you. Like, it was great to see you, uh, but like, yeah, it's just, this species got a lot behind it, so uh, let's keep going. Um, so this is a cool summary profile. Um, this is a, of a lot of sharks, 
but we'll just kind of fast forward to let's see a tropical shark occurring in shore. This is a bottom feeder eating cephalopods, variety of crustaceans, squilla, prawns, crabs, and fishes, cyanids, cool, 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 thread fins. Utilize your human construction, dried, dried, and sold form. Okay, general remarks. Abundant in northern Indian Ocean. Limited fecundity suggests it would be vulnerable to recruitment overfishing. Now that's interesting. This species has been exploited to the optimal level. This is, that's the paper we just saw in 1997. Therefore, conservation regulation is required off Mumbai, northwest coast of India. Uh, here's a photo of the Spano shark. Um, you know, dead specimen. You can still see those important features. And then here's the range. Interesting. So as far as landings go, the dark red area is more than 10,000 tons. So Northwest India, really huge amount of landings for the shark. Southwest India, less than 100 tons. So not very frequent there. And then um, uh, Eastern India, uh, 100 to 500 tons. Kind of keep going. Oh, right. Okay, Scolidon uh, macarinkos, bleaker in 1852. A second species of Spano shark from the Western Pacific. All right, this one's going to be really cool. Uh, the genus Scolidon, represented by a widespread Indo Pacific species, um, Scolidon laticatus, so our Spano shark, was previously considered to be monotypic. Recent molecular analysis of Scullydon from across its geographic range have shown that three species should be recognized. Oh wow, one from the coastal waters of India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, one from the western central Pacific, and a third species from the Bay of Bengal of western Thailand. Scullydon macarinkos, which was described from Bat Batavia, which is Jakarta, Indonesia, is resurrected from the junior synonymy of uh, Scullydon laticatus. As the whereabouts of the holotype of Scolidon macarinkos appears to be unknown and is possibly lost, we provided a redescription of the species based on three of bleaker specimens and recently collected material from the western central Pacific. Although Scolidon macarinkos is morphologically similar to Scolidon laticatus, it differs in some morphological characters and exhibits substantial DNA sequence divergence in the mitochondrial marker NADH2. A third species off Western Thailand requires further investigation to determine its distribution in the Bay of Bengal and conspecificity with uh, Scolidon mullerii, uh, originally described from Bengal by Mulleranale. That's really cool. So there might be three Spano sharks. Um, as of today, I think only two are recognized. So the Spano shark and the new Spano shark, but still. It's really cool to see this paper. This is from, when is this published? This was, this one's from the aughts, I think. Make sure I got that right. I don't want to scroll the, to the top because it's a pretty huge file and uh, I know we're limited on time, but let's see. Oh, look at this! The genus Scullydon is considered to be the closest relative of hammerhead sharks, Sphernidae, and contains one of the smallest carcarine species. Members of this genus are closest to members of Rhizoprionidon and Loxodon, which we saw earlier in the 60s, but in addition to the characters above for the subfamily differ from these genera in their greatly depressed and trowel-shaped snout. More compressed and taller caudal peduncle, broader and more... So this is crazy! So th this actually... So Roy Roy made a comment earlier about like, hey, I wonder if this has a highly uh, a higher proportion of ampullae lorenzini, kind of like the hammerheads. It's kind of wild to see like, oh my gosh, like Spano sharks and hammerheads actually might be more closely related, which is so cool. You know, they both have that weird feature of like just a flat, depressed head. Like the hammerheads, of course, you know, have those like lateral extensions making the cephalofoil. Um, but it's kind of cool to see Scoliodon as like, you know, or the Spano shark is like kind of like a weird intermediary, intermediary step between hammerheads and like other carcarinids. So this is super cool. Uh, I love this. Uh, Genus Scolidon has a very complicated nomenclatural history of early studies. Have you confused it with Loxodon and Rhizoprionidon? Man, 
can. Um, we'll look at that more in detail in a bit. Um, I know we won't get to the whole thing, but just again, this article is Scullidon macarancos, a second species of Spano shark from the Western Pacific by William T. White, Peter R. Last, and Gavin J.P. Naylor. Uh, Naylor is a pretty big shark name, by the way. I've heard of Naylor before. Let's see. Kind of keep looking. All right, here we go. This is... So these are the new descriptions. Um, so this is the new Spano shark, Scolodon macarancos. We'll hop over to other studies. This is another Scolidon macarranco, so new spade nose shark. It's kind of cool to see, look at that. It has a, a dark, uh, a black tip uh, on its caudal fin, so that's pretty cool to see. So I'm gonna catch up the comments. Uh, Roy, Roy, love that comment. Uh, I think it's the closest thing uh, to a hammerhead without a cephalofoil. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Howard Kerr, love that comment. Surely it is, it is called the new Spano shark. Uh, it is. Uh, that is the official FAO name, unfortunately. It's kind of bad, but like, yeah, the new Spano shark. That's the official FA, uh, um, like FAO, like the Food and Agriculture or Organization of the United Nations. It's sadly the official name is the new Spano shark. So it's, it's sad, but there we go. <laughs> Uh, oh, Howard, I appreciate the comment. Our ancestors ate fish. It is sustainable on a hand-to-mouth basis. Um, Roar, I love that comment. Uh, well, there's three of them now. Yes. Uh, I, I didn't realize there were three um, uh, species. Three Scullidon species. And Howard, wow, yes. <laughs> like, it's really bad, actually. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering if it's like, you know, because it physically looks so similar that's why they stuck with that name, but it's bad. It's not good. It's not a good name. So, new Spano shark versus Spano shark, not a good distinction. So, uh, is this another image of it? Uh, no, this is uh, this is a specimen of what we thought was the original Spano shark, but now has been recategorized as the new Spano shark. Interesting. We'll kind of keep going. Um, this is a pretty cool paper, but I do want to um, keep going as far as like, just making sure we touch on everything. We're now in 2011. Uh, case of leucism in the Spano shark, Scolidon laticatus from Mangalore, Karnataka, wait, Karnataka. Okay, Karnataka. Okay, there we go. So um, this is kind of cool. We won't spend a lot of time on this, but um, the present paper reports the first case of leucism in the spatial shark uh, from India. Uh, photographs are taken and measurements recorded using uh, Vermeer calipers. So basically, um, leucism is like partial albinism or um, losing pigmentation. So you can kind of see that here. Uh, fun fact, uh, leucism kind of comes from lucus, uh, which is Latin for white. Um, and I think that originates from the island of Lucos, but um, that is why Carcharhinus lucus has its name. Uh, the original type specimen for bull sharks, Carcharhinus lucus, was um, preserved incorrectly and it was all white. And so they thought the shark naturally appeared as a white shark and it's not. Um, but that's why it has its name Carcharhinus lucus. So it's kind of cool to see like the Latin name of bull sharks, Carcharhinus lucus, ties in with leucism, ties in with like, um, um, albinism or like you know just kind of like losing pigmentation so here it's actually really cool to see this particularly rare individual of spade nose shark where it has lost some pigmentation on its back so oh did we pick a shark for next week by the way wait a minute uh, let me go back in the comments I'm so sorry guys let's let's see I, I got so excited about the research that I don't think we picked one shoot oh right um 
Aurora, I remember seeing footage of Nurse Shark with subtle Lucasum. Oh, cool. Very cool. And then Howard, not yet. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> like, at least name it after someone or something. I'm, I'm going to start that comment. That's awesome. Because, yeah, it's... it's uh, Bramble Shark. Yes. Okay, that's a great pick. Yes, because I, I, I think you mentioned that on last stream too, Roy Roy. But yes, Bramble Shark. Excellent pick. Um, and I know there's footage. I actually got Bramble Shark recommendations on my YouTube the other day. So, hell yeah. Let's do that. This is a kind of rank is Brucus. Or kind of Rhinus, sorry, a kind of Rhinus, Brucus. This one's really cool. Um, this is a, it's in its own entirely own order. A kind of Rhinoforms is its own thing, yeah. It used to be considered Squaliforms, but Bramble Sharks are now considered to be like an entirely new branch of sharks, which is really cool. And I, I especially love it because, um, yeah, I especially love it because when I was a kid, I grew up with, um, I think it was just eight orders. It was like Hexantiforms, Squaliforms, Prisciforiforms, Squatiniforms, Heterodontiforms, Erectiloboforms, Lambdaforms, Carcharinoforms, so it's eight. Echinorhinoforms is nine, uh, brand new order. So it's really, really cool. Uh, so great pick. I'm really excited to break into a brand new order of sharks next week. Oh, man. Um, I know I don't have to, like, end exactly at 11, but I should be wrapping up close because I want to keep these streams closer to two hours. There's so much research on the species, but that's, all, that's, that's a lot of time studying sharks, so I just want to make sure... I want to be respectful of time, so we'll kind of hop forward. Um, and I kind of just want to look at either summaries or graphs. Uh, or sorry, like summaries or diagrams of the Spain and Shark, just to see if there's anything pretty cool we can see. Uh, locally, Spain and Shark is called a sand he. Uh, let's see. Uh, Sarastra Coast. Uh, it's called sand he. It's kind of cool. Okay, nothing really new on that. Keep moving on. Cool little species profile here. Uh, this is the FAO guide on spade nose sharks. It's so cool to know that, like, you know, look at this. Um, based on this tooth right here, this is really cool. Based on this tooth right here, what do you think this is? Do you think this is a male or a female? Because uh, I think we can confidently tell the difference now. Let me make sure they don't have that labeled, by the way. Yeah, they don't have that. Oh, uh, woo, this is this is an interesting guide. Okay. Do you think this is a male or a female? Yes, okay. I think it's a female as well. Now, this is an interesting guide because the sketch drawing of the shark itself is a male because you have the claspers. But the tooth, the tooth type definitely looks female because it's the blade teeth. Uh, males have like those like, you know, pointed teeth. So um, this is really cool. And this this is kind of like, I, it's cool to see this play out in an FAO guide. You know, this is like the official guide for identifying the species where it's like, I think they mixed it up. So I think they have a drawing of a male here, um, but they pull teeth from a female because uh, that looks like that looks like the female tooth type as far as like you know the bladed teeth. So really great guesses, guys. I, I definitely I definitely agree with you that I think that's what it is as far as like I think these teeth come from a female specimen, but the drawing is a male specimen. So so cool. All right. Oh, this is kind of cool. Color note: gray, brown above, above, light below. Sometimes with obscure saddle bands. Interesting. All fins with light margins. Very interesting color note there. Um, I think the rest of these, these are fishery studies where the shark shows up a little bit. So we might be close to wrapping up for tonight. I'm just gonna, yeah. These are kind of like notes of just general collections of 
Um, sharks in India um, and kind of like identification guides. Let's see. More genetic stuff. Oh, look at this. The Malacca Strait acts as a boundary delineating the distribution range of the Pacific Spano Shark. That's a better name, so I hope they're sticking with that name now. Pacific Spano Shark would be a little bit better than New Spano Shark, but Pacific Spano Shark, Scolodon microrhynchus, is in the east, to the east end of the Northern Indian Ocean. Scolodon latitatus is a classic Spano Shark to the west. Interesting. Interesting. So that's so that's cool. cool. So, so it sounds, it sounds like, like there's a, a actual like, actual like ge ge um, um, geographical, geographical barrier, barrier um, um, you know, that you know, that's helped separate separate species. species. Um, um, I know I can't. I know I can't. I can't talk about the just uh, 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 that, that separates, separates like the Virginia Virginia region from the Gulf of Maine Bay. But that but that this is probably more akin to like. Like Panama, like Panama, where, where like, like on the other side, other side uh, on each on side, side of like, like Panama, Panama or the Panama Canal, Canal um, or, or really just Panama, Panama in general, like, like yeah, two really, really similar groups of species, species, but like they start kind of over time as like um, that used to be an open seaway, and then as that closed, um, the Pacific and the Caribbean species start becoming more and more distinct. Um, it just kind of reminds me of that, where the Malacca Strait. Um, it looks like it was enough of a geographical barrier to start splitting the two Scolidons up into the Spano shark and then the new slash Pacific Spano shark. So that's pretty cool. Oh, here we go. Okay, so the bottom two, this is kind of crazy to see. And I know it's 11, so I think we might end on this. So the top one is the Pacific species. The bottom two are the Indian Ocean, like the original Spano shark, the subject of tonight's stream. And these are really hard to tell apart. Um, you know, part of it is because of specimen damage, but like, wow, those look really, really similar. Um, it, look at even the dorsal fins. The dorsal fins just like look... It almost looks like B and C, which are both, um, you know, Scolodon laticatus. They, they, they even look different, but that could be a size thing. Um, there, there we go. Let's see. Um, figure A is a male that is about um, 426 millimeters. Figure B is a male that's 394, so this is a smaller one. Figure C is a female 524. So, yeah, but that's really hard to tell apart though. That's pretty crazy. Um, it almost looks like the male um, uh, Spano shark has more of like a flattened dorsal fin and the female has more of an erect dorsal fin. But again, that could be specimen damage. So it's, it's hard to tell, but wow. So it's 11. So I think we'll kind of wrap up. The rest of the papers really were more like um, you know, how the species plays a role in like just fisheries in its range. So, um, but I think this is a good note to end on where, um, you know, we're kind of seeing that like there's a geographical barrier that's split these populations genetically. They look really similar, but they're two different species. So pretty cool note. I think it's a pretty cool note to end on. So, um, but thank you guys so much for watching. This was a very surprising shark. I, I really loved what we learned tonight about the Spano shark. Um, really great shark to research as far as like great nexus for that discussion on the food use of sharks and like, you know, how we want to support shark conservation, but recognize that some communities might need them like as or certain species. So it's a really cool point of discussion. And, um, my favorite part, honestly, is just, this is wildly different from a lot of other sharks that we've seen. This is biologically a really unique species, just you know, physically it looks different. The sexual dimorphism is crazy, um, you know, as far as the tooth type goes. So really cool shark with a lot of surprises. So, but thank you guys so much for watching. It's great to see you. And I'm glad that this new setup uh, worked out really well, actually. I think this was a lot of fun. Uh, the soundtrack came in uh, pretty fun, I think. So 
Um, but it was great seeing you guys. I hope you have a great week, and I'm really excited to see you next week for the Bramble Shark. Um, and I'm pretty sure there's some great Bramble Shark footage. I, I mean, I keep getting Bramble Shark recommendations on YouTube, so we're going to go back to observing sharks in life. So, But take care, guys. Hope you have a good one, and thanks so much for watching. See you soon.